name is David Olson. I'm a professor here at the law school, and I'm the faculty director of the Program on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, or as we like to call it, PI. Um, we began PI as a way to provide a focal point for a number of the things we already do well here at the law school. Uh, so we encourage scholars in business, in tax, intellectual property, experiential learning, and other areas to consider their work in light of um, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship, which have both been so important to improving human welfare. PI promotes its mission through supporting research, providing thought leadership, and bringing to campus discussions of important related legal issues. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dean Vincent Rougeau. He's provided wonderful leadership to the Boston College Law School for the past eight years now. Dean Rougeau received his AB magna cum laude from Brown University in 1985. And I understand your son is just starting there as a freshman. Along with, along with uh, Lisa Ropel's uh, son. Uh, he received his JD from Harvard Law School in 1988. He's a vocal advocate for change in legal education. He writes and speaks extensively on legal education reform. He has served as a member of the Executive Committee of the American Association of Law Schools on the Council of the Boston Bar Association. He currently serves as chair of the AALS Dean's Steering Committee. Dean Rogio here at the law school has led a reorganization in leadership structure. Uh, it, this reorganization supports a more holistic approach to student services expands the school's national and international recruitment of a diverse student body, and enhances the school's commitment to experiential learning and to global engagement. I'm personally grateful for his support of PI and the activities in which we engage, like the activity tonight. Last but not least, Dean Rougeau is an expert in Catholic social thought. He is, of his many works, his book, Christians in the American Empire, Faith and Citizenship in the New World Order, was released by Oxford University Press. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dean Rougeau. Thanks uh, very much, David, and welcome. Good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us this evening. And we here at Boston College Law School are very pleased indeed to host this important conversation with Assistant Attorney General John Demers. Before we begin, though, I'd like to thank some people who made all of this possible. First, I want to thank uh, Dean Karen Moncaster of the Woods College of Advancing Studies for co-sponsoring this event. It's wonderful to have you here, Karen, our newest decanal co colleague here at BC Law, at Boston College. Um, and at BC Law, <laughs> I'm used to <laughs> It just slips out. <laughs> um, our collaboration with the Woods College in the area of cybersecurity has been very fruitful, and we look forward to further collaboration. I'd also like to thank uh, Kevin Powers, who's the founding director of the Masters in Cybersecurity Policy and Governance program at the Woods College. Kevin is also a lawyer who uh, serves as an assistant professor of the practice here at BC Law, where he teaches a cross-listed course on cybersecurity that is very popular and useful to our students. Here at the law school, uh, I'd like to thank David Olson, of course, and the Program on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, but you now know that it's PI, uh, for co-sponsoring this program and for continuing to bring important speakers and events like this to campus. I'd also like to thank uh, Nate Kenyon, Joan Manna, Vicki Sanders, and Wayne Daly for all of the logistical work that they did in pulling this together and for publicizing this event and other events like it. Now, I don't want to delay you too long from, from hearing our speaker, but I would like to say that we're really very happy here to be fulfilling part of our mission as a university and as a law school uh, by being of service to the public and hosting important discussions like the one you're going to hear today. Boston College Law School has a long history of research, teaching, and clinical work in the areas of justice and the rule of law. We formed partnerships with universities and judiciaries around the world within which we provide education and training on the important role of law and the protection of individual rights. So it's very fitting today that we host a discussion on some of the hottest and most important legal issues of our time. How to preserve national security, provide cyber security, and properly use laws and law enforcement as tools to protect our nation and our citizens' interests, while at the same time respecting the rule of law, individual rights, freedom of trade, and freedom of association. So with that, I would like to welcome you once again, and I will now hand the microphone over to Kevin Powers. Thank you very much Thank for being here. All right. Um, 
Before we begin, sir, I just want to outline here is this is my cybersecurity uh, law and policy class. Mm -hmm. So we have, I think, 60, 65 of my students here who are in the grad program, and then we have a cross list with the law school and the Lynch School of Education. So we have some undergrads here. We have, I think, 25 students from the Woods College undergrad criminal law class here as well. And then we have a smattering of uh, my grad students mm -hmm. and uh, my advisory board, and we have Lisa, 10 others here as well. Um, and why am I pointing that out? Well, one, this is what my class is always like, Karen. We usually have it set up here. And uh, you know, it's not just about, yeah, it's not just about you know, national security, it's about job security. <laughs> All right, with, uh, with that, what we do uh, with all our guests who come and speak in our classroom, it's really, you know, we don't do the big introduction. What we want to know is hear from you, sir, is, you know, if you could give us a glimpse into who you are, you know, where you went to school, how you found yourself in the position you are, and the career path you followed to get there. Well, thanks, Kevin, and thanks to all of you who, uh, you know, work so hard to arrange this. So I really appreciate being here. and love being back on, uh, in an academic setting. Uh, the question that we should start with is what's a nice Holy Cross boy like me doing a place like this? But uh, the, uh, you know, we'll, I'll have to figure that out later. I guess. The answer is Holy Cross didn't invite me. So, uh, but um, no, I, so, you know, being in this area of the law, national security, is I mean, for those of you who are, um, especially for those of you who are JD students here, um, you know, it may be difficult to appreciate that when I went to law school, this area did not exist as its own discipline. There may have been classes that now you would take as part of such a discipline, but it didn't really exist. And I think, uh, you know, what, obviously what changed all of that was September 11th. And I was here uh, in uh, Boston on September 11th working at a firm with Lisa uh, when it happens. And I remember it, uh, you know, very clearly. And I don't, I don't know that uh, as momentous as it was, I appreciated how much obviously it would change my career going forward. Uh, I uh, had thought about uh, working for the Justice Department uh, before September 11th, but I think, you know, in light of what happened on September 11th, it made me uh, want to uh, go down to D.C. Mm -hmm. and uh, see if I could be of service in the public sector uh, as well. So um, it was, you know, in many ways for the law, for the department, as we'll talk about, talk a little bit about the National Security Division, uh, and then obviously in my own career, kind of a, a, a big change and one that uh, was not anticipated going down this path. So for those of you who are students, I just ask that you, know, you, you keep an open mind about what the future will bring because there are things that will happen that you're not anticipating. Don't worry about planning out your career from now until the day you're buried. Uh, just enjoy it, do what you love to do, and um, the rest will follow and, and be open to, to these changes. So I did, I spent about 10 years of my life here in Boston, so it's, it's always fun to come back. My sister-in-law still lives here. Um, I um, uh, you know, went to Holy Cross College, as my first question suggested, uh, and, uh, and then uh, took a few years off and then went back to law school here at Harvard. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of um, you know, how I got into this, uh, uh, you know, job or to this area really was uh, September 11th. And one of the lessons of September 11th, there, there were many, but, but one of them that I think the government learned was that we were not well organized to deal with national security issues. So there's the whole, after the 9-11 Commission and then after the Weapons on Mass Destruction Commissions, one of the themes of the findings of those commissions was that we were uh, poorly organized, and it, but, but purposefully so, because the prevailing th thinking, uh, both, not both, throws in the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature was that there needed to be a very strict separation between law enforcement and uh, intelligence work in order to protect civil liberties. And so uh, people who were working in those areas, whether they were at the FBI or they were at the Justice Department, were kept separate. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, after 9-11, I think interestingly, and this is another cautionary tale if you're a student, is what had been conventional wisdom became conventional foolishness. And so you have to be very careful about these big tectonic shifts in 
uh, the, the, the conceptual framework about the, in the area of the law that you're practicing. And so suddenly, you know, something that had been endorsed by administration after administration at the executive level, expected by Congress, enforced by the courts, was now thought to have been to, nonsensical. And so the end result on the organizational side was the creation of, I mean, obviously at, at the big level, the, the Department of Homeland Security was a big organizational result of it, but in the Justice Department of the National Security Division, which was the first new division in the department since the Civil Rights Division. Uh, and it was a recommendation of the Weapons on Mass Destruction Commission. And they said, okay, all you parts of the Justice Department that have been working together have been scattered throughout the department. We're all now going to put you in one division and have one Assistant Attorney General for National Security. So I was uh, clerking when that happened for Justice Scalia. And I was thinking, oh, I'll go back to a firm after that. And then um, the DOJ folks called and they said, hey, we're setting up this new division. Would you like to be a part of it? And uh, as you could tell by my current job, I'm like a sucker for these opportunities. So uh, I could not resist the temptation and I said yes. But I didn't know that much about national security law, right? Like I couldn't spell FISA. So, uh, but it didn't matter. That's my third lesson for law school students. Just, you know, you, you were learning the law, you were learning to uh, be analytical, you were, you were learning to write, you were learning your judgment along the way. You know, those are skills that will uh, allow you to prosper in whatever area of the law you choose, and even if, you know, you find yourself in an area of law that you're not practiced in. And as an aside, when I was in private practice and, and in the private sector, my belief was you just hire the best lawyer you can get your hands on and they'll figure out what the law is, right? So, um, the, uh, uh, so, you know, so I went to NSD and, uh, and I was there in the front office of NSD, so on the management team of, of the National Security Division, and we were just starting up. And it was, you know, a management um, challenge as much as a legal one because you're taking people who never worked together in their lives and you're asking them, you need to work together and you need to work more closely with the FBI, et cetera. And they had been taught that it was improper to share some of what they were now being told to share together. So that is a big cultural change for the organization and for the individuals in the organization. And, uh, but in addition to that, which was a more sort of an organizational issue for the department, um, it, it was still the height of um, our counterterrorism operations, right? And so, the big push those days was, you know, obviously on the, on the counterterrorism job. And the NSD job was, you know, first and foremost a counterterrorism job. We always had a counterespionage division. We always did work in some other areas, but that's what it was. Uh, and uh, so I did get involved in the changes to our foreign intelligence surveillance law uh, that we got through Congress in 2007. Uh, or 2008, ultimately, and it was, um, and, and I learned how to spell FISA and a lot of other details about FISA along the way. Today, of course, you know, we've gone from people not knowing FISA is to everybody having an opinion on what probable cause is under FISA. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, th there's been a big change uh, that way as well, and um, it's, uh, you know, it was a very rewarding experience, but I'll stop there, because, I mean, you are supposed to, like, Ask some questions. Or, yes. As you can see, I could just like talk. So yeah, I know. <laughs> um, that was supposed to be the deal. <laughs> well, then my next question. So you were at the uh, National Security Division, yeah. and then where did you go next? Yeah. So then, <laughs> so then it was the end of the administration. So one of the things you have to decide if you go into government is: Am I going to be career? Or am I going to be political? Right. And if your career, the upside is you get to stick around for a very long time. The downside is you know, you will hit a ceiling and you'll have a rotating group of 35 year olds uh, telling you what to do. So it's like, well, which do I want to be? And when, so when I went back, I was first in the department as a career employee, but when I went back after my clerkship, I went in as a political employee. So very cognizant since we were in the post Katrina world of the fact that things did not look good for the Republican party in mm -hmm. 2008. And uh, that turned out to be the case. And uh, so, you know, I knew I was going to have to leave in, in 2009. 
And it was, it, I was very sad to leave the department the first time. Mm -hmm. And it's very strange when you're a political because, you know, the election happens in early November, but you don't switch out until, you know, mid-January. So you have this, you could just up and leave right away, but I, I stuck it out to the last day. And so, you know, you have this long period of time where you kind of just start counting down and you know, and your day-to-day -day hasn't really changed. And that's one of the things I love about national security is it doesn't really matter. I mean, there are things to work on all the time, right? So the day-to-day -day doesn't change, but on the back of your mind every day, you know, it's one day fewer, one day fewer, and then the transition people come in and you're starting to brief them up on it and, uh, you know, and, and it becomes more and more real. So I was kind of dreading the last day right. at the Justice Department. And I dreaded it until the last day. And then very oddly, um, as I was walking out of the building and I handed my security, this, my uh, card to the security guard who was there, the, the officer who was there, I, I had this overwhelming feeling like, you know what, it's done. And it's time to move on and do the next thing. And it was such a strong feeling. I remember at the time thinking, I hope this is the, day, the way I feel on the day that I pass away. <laughs> because it was such a feeling of satisfaction. And I thought, wow, this is pretty good. Yeah. And it's just like that part of my life was done. And it's time to move on. So I went to Boeing. Uh, I also didn't know anything about aerospace or government contracts law. So it's just you can follow. This is the first job I've actually known something about uh, that I did um, uh, when I worked you know, at least I didn't know the first thing about insurance law, and I ended up doing a ton of, ton of insurance law. Strangely enough, the World Trade Center insurance property litigation at the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, I went, I went to Boeing. They were developing their um, Washington, D.C. office. Uh, it was, uh, you know, there was a new, fairly new general counsel at the time, Judge Ludig, who was a judge on the Fourth Circuit, and had been brought into the company to revitalize the law department, and uh, so they were looking for people, they were looking for people in DC, and again, somebody who I had actually gone to law school with reached out to me and said, hey, do you want to interview for a job in DC? And again, to the point of taking chances and just mm -hmm. going in a different direction, one that was, I didn't expect, I, I was not looking at in-house opportunities, I didn't interview anywhere else in-house, I looked at some firms. Uh, that they offered me this job and I decided to take it. So at Boeing, I ended up on the, heading up the international legal function for Boeing um, and had amazing status on airlines, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but spent a lot of time away from home, which was a bummer. And then, uh, but also on the government, uh, on the defense side, therefore kind of a government contracts, right. uh, legal issues. Um, and then ultimately for about a year, headed up the international government affairs uh, for the company which was a lot of fun, and again, outside, not a legal job, you know, right. more of a policy job. So um, I was having a grand old time when, you could ask me the next question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Like it's, yeah. <laughs> which one do you want me to ask? Um, so after Boeing, yeah. you know, what, what happened? Yeah, so I was at Boeing, <laughs> and uh, sitting at my desk one day when uh, somebody who, who uh, from the Justice Department called and they said, hey, are you interested in uh, being the, the AAG for national security? And I said, well, that's something I have to think about, obviously talk to my family about. So I went home and I got two reactions. My wife asked me, which part of your life are you not happy with? <laughs> it's not a great reaction. And then uh, my kid, my daughter uh, said, daddy, I don't know why you want to leave all your friends you work with your friends, why are you gonna go do, you know, this other thing? So it, you know, it was strange, like I was, um, but, and I went kind of back and forth about whether I would do this or not, to be honest. Because I was having a great time at Boeing, and um, I was like, wow, I'm kinda gonna turn my life upside down here, it seems unpredictable, God only knows what comes next, you know, and, uh, and, in my mind had decided, okay, I'm not gonna do this. And then I had another one of those feelings like, oh my gosh, if I don't do this, I'm gonna regret this on my last days. Mm -hmm. I keep pondering my final <laughs> days here, but. You're a good Catholic. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's appropriate law school for me to you know, ponder the ultimate end of life. So the. Um, it's always the end. Of this life. 
So, uh, so uh, you know, it really was this feeling like, no, this would be a major mistake for me not to, to do this. It is in many ways uh, a, you know, a dream to be able to go back and lead this division that I was a, the be there for the beginning of. Um, I had kept up with the people who were you know, the assistants attorney general in the previous administration. I, I knew them. I knew what they had done. I knew kind of how the work of the, the division had changed. And so um, you know, I still felt, felt very close to, um, uh, to the division and mm -hmm. to the work it did. And so I decided, yeah, sure, let's go for it. And then a year later, I got confirmed. So you know, that's a long process, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's all right. All right, so now you're at um, DOJ, so you're heading there. up the National Security Division. Uh, if you could, for our students, you know, really give us an overview of what NSD does. Yeah, so NSD uh, uh, is, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the, the first new division in the department, really a reorganization. It is, it has sort of, the way it's organized, sort of counterterrorism, right, counter um, uh, espionage or, you know, export control, those issues. And then um, uh, the, what we call the Office of Intelligence, which is the office that uh, brings, uh, all, all the lawyers that bring to the FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the applications for surveillance of people who are either agents of international terrorist organizations or of uh, foreign countries, mm -hmm. foreign powers. So, um, and. The bulk of the lawyers, so there's about 360 people in the, in the division, lawyers and non-lawyers, the bulk of them, uh, the plurality of them, are in the Office of Intelligence. So it's, it's a significantly sized office, but it's not one that you, know, y you would ever hear about, right? They're not in court prosecuting, prosecuting terrorism cases, they're not in court prosecuting spies. Right. They're doing their work, they're in court, they're in the FISA court, but that's a classified ex parte setting. So, um, and then, you know, within, you know, I'll, I'll mention this because it's become a sort of a bigger part of our job. There's a law and policy group. So we have an appellate shop and we work on sort of policy issues that relate to national security. The thinking of that was, we don't have dedicated people doing national security policy. The operational day-to-day -day swallows the policy. And so you don't really confront the policy issues. Um, and that was one of the, lessons I think that we learned and you know we had let some of our intelligence laws get stale as technology moved past them right and so um, uh, and, and the folks you know who were doing the policy there they were also doing FISA applications every day and that you know became uh, too much so uh, but we have within our uh, sort of our counterintelligence group um, the uh, our CFIUS groups, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the U.S., are then that they review as part of an interagency process. They review uh, foreign investments, uh, foreign purchases uh, of uh, U.S. companies. So that's we can kind of get to that later, but that that's an an increasing uh, part of of what we do, and, and much bigger than it was in. Um, you know, back in 2006, 2009. All right, um, what I'm gonna do now is really focus in on uh, your current initiative that you're spearheading, mm -hmm. that's called the China Initiative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I think the way to, you know, we can flow on this, but I, I'd like you to go kind of like, what, you know, what, you know, caused the China Initiative to mm -hmm. come about, you know, what's really that threat, and then once we go through that, uh, talk about what it actually is, what is this mm -hmm. initiative, you know, what it does, what you're working on, uh, and then, you know, close it out with, you know, what's the results? Mm -hmm. you know, have they been successful? Is it actually working? Mm -hmm. And, you know, speak to that. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is then take questions from the audience if that yeah. works. Great. So I think, you know, as, as I mentioned, you know, 2006, 2009, Al-Qaeda counterterrorism job. Mm -hmm. Fast forward nine years, return to the division. We still have, obviously, uh, you know, a terrorist threat. We now have... A domestic terrorist threat as well, so we're working on that. But the big change in the division was the growth of the nation state as a threat actor. And when we say nation state, we're really talking about four countries, right? That's China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea. Mm -hmm. Those are the four countries that, that really pose a national security threat to the U.S. and its allies. So um, the uh, 
that, so now, you know, the previous administration, they reorganized the division to have a section that focuses just on that. And with that, sort of the use of cyber as a tool of projecting nation state power and of acquiring what nation states want, depending on what that is. So we obviously saw that in the 2016 election, and we see that as we'll talk about sort of on, on the Chinese side. We also see a lot of use of cyber by the Iranians and by the North Koreans. Each of these countries, uh, you know, is focused, but they're all sophisticated cyber actors, and some of them have become much better, but they've all become much better over time. But um, the, uh, you know, they're after different things, right? right? So, you know, the Russians were quite, you know, now aware of what they were after in the in the 2016 elections, the use of, of cyber to to spread this information. Perhaps the most significant they, thing they did, the, the hack and dump of the DNC emails. Um, and, uh, um, and they continue to you know, spread disinformation and try to um, uh, exacerbate existing divisions within our society over sensitive issues. So that's Russia. Now Russia also has another part where what they're doing is, you know, they're obviously, um, uh, you know, interested as much in um, military technologies and also in sort of uh, infrastructure. So to turn to the Chinese, we talk about the Iranians and North Koreans too if you have questions about them. The Iranian, the North Koreans need hard cash, right? So the case we indicted last year is like the theft of money from the Bank of Bangladesh. Uh, so they need cash, the regime is, is starving for cash and they'll get it you know, various ways they can. So that's mm -hmm. a very different type of cyber activity, one that you would more associate with a criminal actor than with a country. Right. right. And, and what's the differentiator with China? You know, that really prompted Yeah, so that. China, so, he, so here's how the, the China initiative came about. So China is the number one sort of nation state threat. I think we face on a multiple uh, fronts and only some of which really concern my work, right, in, uh, on the law enforcement side. Um, but, uh, we have a three times a week under the, the former attorney general. You know, there's this uh, uh, morning briefing by the FBI of um, the leadership at the Justice Department, uh, and um, uh, and they go through whatever the threats are of the day. It started after 9/11, so it was as you can imagine. It was every day. It was really early, and it was counterterrorism, counter you know, and it was really plot specific. That's evolved over time as the threats have evolved over time. So today, you know, the briefing um, is much broader and it's right. all intel, including stuff that's more, you know, not actionable for the Justice Department, but you need to know that what countries are up to. And as the former AG and I were sitting through these briefings, um, you know, we, I think we were both sort of um, struck by how many, how much of the content included China. Uh, and the breadth of activities emanating from uh, China, from the Chinese government. And so we, um, uh, we, we, you know, we started talking about well, what, how, what, what can we do about this right. from our perspective and uh, we decided to do, uh, you know, the, the AG launched this China initiative, right? And the point of uh, the China initiative is, you know, to um, ensure that the department, both me, NSD, and the um, U.S. Attorney's offices, right, 94 U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, uh, and their uh, FBI counterparts are focused on the issue of what China is trying to do, both on the, the foreign influence side and on the um, economic espionage side. A lot of what we're seeing, and when we when I use the term economic espionage, uh, it, it, there's an economic espionage statute in the U.S. Code, and uh, it, what it means is basically the theft of trade secrets for the benefit of a state, mm -hmm. right? So there's a separate trade secrets charge under the U.S. Code, which is based on the theft of trade secrets, but you don't have to show the involvement of a, of a state, and that's one that even right. two American companies could use against each other, or I mean, they don't use the statute against each other, but they can engage in that kind of conduct and right. that we could use the statute. So, um, the, um, so economic espionage is what 
we saw occurring. Now, the seminal moment in this area of Chinese economic espionage was back in 2014 in the prior administration mm -hmm. when um, my predecessor uh, uh, charged a group of uh, PLA officers for the theft of intellectual property for, from American companies for the benefit of um, Chinese companies. That's a big deal um, at the time, right? Because that's not a law enforcement decision. It's a foreign policy decision, right? right? And so um, it was um, a, a big deal for the Justice Department to be able to do that. And you're charging members of the government for doing their government jobs. So what's our theory of the case and our, our conceptual theory is you are doing an activity which is not a traditional intelligence or military activity. You are stealing for the benefit of the private sector. That is not something that the US intelligence services do and it's not something that the intelligence services of the bulk of um, countries around the world do. So, um, that's the that that that's the conceptual line that you draw between. So it's the uh, you know you're not charging the government people for is helping out the companies using their resources yes. to steal the intellectual property for their benefit. Yes, for that for that con for in this case China's okay. benefit. So um, what's the goal? Of that? Eighty percent. Well, so the goal of it is economic development. Right. So eighty percent mm -hmm. of our um, economic espionage cases since the beginning of the statute in the mid 1990s involve China as the state actor, right? Um, that's a bad news story in that it reflects how big a problem China is. In some respects, that's a good news story because you, if 80% are China, then actually you have relatively few of the other countries, which means you actually have a pretty good consensus in the international community that this is not something you should do. And after the 2014 indictment in 2015, President Obama, the Chinese premier, agreed, committed to, uh, not engaging in that kind of cyber activity. We have now indicted conduct that demonstrates that the Chinese haven't lived up to that commitment. Um, then that became even a G20 agreement. So, you know, a lot of countries have signed on to the idea that their intelligence officers and their militaries aren't supposed to be doing this kind of activity. So the goal, if you look at it um, from, you know, what the Chinese are trying to do is, you know, obviously uh, you start with the understanding that this is a very authoritarian, very centrally planned economy and country, right? And so to look at what they're stealing, you look at the Made in China 2025 plan, which is kind of a roadmap to where the Chinese want to be in terms of economic development. And it, it, it uh, highlights 10 tech areas of technology that the Chinese consider will be the forefront of technology in 2025. And if they have significant domestic capabilities in those technologies, then they have succeeded uh, in their Made in China 2025 plan. And it's a diverse range, right? So it's commercial airplanes, it's new materials like composites and carbon fiber, it's high-speed rail, it's uh, maritime, uh, you know, buoyancy materials, it's artificial intelligence, it's uh, agricultural technology, it's, you know, so in each of those categories, I mean, I say like agricultural technology, that's a lot of stuff, right? It's life sciences issues, sort of pharmaceuticals, right. that's a lot of stuff, right? So each of them is really a very significant category um, in and of itself. So it starts there, right? And, um, and then, you know, we, if you look at the cases that we've charged, you know, eight of 10, 10 of 10, depending on how you sort of look at them, um, we've charged cases in eight of 10 of those categories or perhaps 10 of 10 of those categories. Uh, so it shows you, you know, this is the plan they're following. They, this is well organized. This is not let a thousand flowers of intellectual property theft bloom, right? right? And this is like, no, this is what you're going to get, and this is what you're going to get, and this is what you're going to get. And, and I saw when you testified before Congress about the China mm -hmm. initiative, what I liked, it, it, you kind of concluded like any good trial attorney should, where you came up and said like, well, it's really about, you know, rob, replicate, replace. Right. It, which, you know, everyone will remember that now. The whole idea is we're going to steal the property, yeah. the intellectual property, right. we're going to replicate it, right. and then we're going to put you out of business. Yes. And that's the plan. 
So I'll give you an example of one of those cases we've charged is, uh, involves a company named Micron. And uh, Micron makes DRAM, which is a computer memory chip. Not a particularly uh, high-end computer memory chip, but ubiquitous. So it's mm -hmm. billions and billions of dollars a year from market size. The Chinese import all of their DRAM chips, right? So they decided at the very highest levels, enough of that, right? We're going to have domestic manufacturing capability. They funded a company called Fujian Xinhua to the tune of, you know, five or six billion dollars. And they said, well, now this company, and they built a factory, is going to make these chips. But they were missing one thing, mm -hmm. the intellectual property they needed to develop the chip. So how are they going to get it, right? How is this company going to get it? Mm -hmm. The company was going to get it by ultimately, I mean, there's a JV involved, et cetera, but to, to make a, a more complicated structure short, mm -hmm. poaching employees from this American, this Taiwan subsidiary of this American company called Micron, not in the very nice way that a lot of professionals get poached from their jobs, but in the way that it's like, wow, you have this intellectual property that I want, so um, you should uh, you know, bring it with you when you come and work and you can have this great job. And that is allegedly, since their cases are still pending, they're actually charged in Taiwan the, through the employees by, by the Taiwanese authorities and we've brought charges against the companies here in San Francisco. But uh, they allegedly went over with the property. So the company, you know, to its credit, uh, and when I do outreach to the private sector, I always use this example because uh, the company, to its credit, came to us right away, came to the FBI very quickly, and um, was looking for the government's help. And it, it, it had sort of figured out what had gone on in investigating this. And so we were able to, you know, the FBI was able to do the investigation. We brought these charges. And then the Commerce Department put the Chinese company on the denied entity list. Now, if you're not an export control uh, geek, the denied entity list means you cannot import anything from the United States if you're a foreign country. So you're, you're, any American company is blocked from right, selling to you, so, which means that this Chinese company cannot import the tooling that it needs to create the chips that they took the intellectual property to create. And there have been newspaper reports that show that factory sitting empty today. It's five or six billion dollar investment. Will it be empty forever? I don't know. But we, at least at this stage, have mitigated the harm that would have occurred to this American company under that rob, replicate, and replace right. philosophy um, uh, as a result of you know, this theft. And so that's, as we go to the private sector, it's a story that we use because we do want the private sector to come and uh, work with us in trying to help you know, solve this problem and do these investigations. Great, and that leads us now to the China Initiative. Like, yes, spearheading. So the China Initiative, you know, uh, you know, as I said, we put together, and the, the the focus of the China Initiative is to get the department in all of its, you know, ninety four offices around the country, really focused on bringing these cases and spending the time and energy it takes to do these cases. Mm -hmm. These are difficult cases. These are complicated cases. These cases involve. Sometimes intelligence, community equities, and the information you're getting there and have to protect, um, they can be difficult to assemble. So it's going out to the U.S. attorneys and saying, "Look, I, we understand. You know, they, they uh, you know, this is not going to be like you're doing a whole bunch of drug cases or you're doing a whole bunch of gun cases, and you can come in at the end of the year and say, look at my stats,' and they look awesome, right? It's saying to them, if you have a good year in this world." In a, in a one district, you know, one of these 94 districts, you'll have one case. If you had two, that would be astonishing. If you had zero, that would be expected. But we want you to focus on it. We want you to uh, spend the resources both on the FBI side and the AUSA side, you know, working on these cases. And, the, um, and then obviously, you know, we will support you, um, you know, for on, on the main justice side. Right. Now, so, when you say focusing on these cases, uh, I'm assuming you're working with private industry on this, and you know the people who are getting attacked and having their yeah. intellectual property stolen. Can you talk on how you're doing that? Like, how are you 
you know, focusing on those cases, yeah. or finding those cases, or what type of outreach you're doing. Right. Who's it with? Right. So many of these cases, um, you know, come to us from the private sector mm -hmm. or from uh, you know research institutes, right? And they've noticed something, right? One of either a computer intrusion or uh, you know an employee who is doing something that uh, he or she shouldn't have been doing. And uh, so they, they come to us that way. Sometimes the intelligence community or the FBI will see things happening at a company and go to the company, okay. right? So it, it happens both ways, but most of these cases come to us from the private sector. Um, then, uh, you know, you have to do the work of obviously, you know, building the case together. And when you're talking about economic espionage, you know, you have to link it back to a foreign government. Right. right, so it's not enough to know that this employee was stealing this intellectual property, but you know you're doing the investigation to see whether you know that person was being directed um, by the state or otherwise doing something for the benefit of the state. So the these you know um, that's you know you know in, in rough form that that that's that's what we're doing with these cases. Um, I want to say one thing because you know, and, and you know, this is an issue that can come up in this area because when you're talking about China, you know, um, obviously we're, we're we're talking about the Chinese government, right? And um, we have to focus in these investigations, and when we work with the private sector, or we work with the with academia on conduct, mm -hmm. right, and not on ethnicity, right, because that's. Uh, we, you know, what we're doing is we're following tips that we receive from companies, we're following information we get from our law enforcement partners or our intelligence community partners, um, and, uh, you know, we're following that wherever it may lead, right? So, and, and, and the corollary to that is this, the, we, we can't let the actions of the governments put all of their nationals under a cloud of suspicion. Right, because most of them are here, honestly, they're here to contribute to our companies, to our society, uh, and uh, they're here, uh, and, and they, they do provide great value. Right. And we can't, you know, we would be foolish to lose all of that as we, you know, work to ferret out the few who are here to, to do the, the, the malicious handiwork of their governments. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so we're, we're really, uh, I don't mean to interrupt. Yeah. You. You look at some of the cases you worked on. Uh, was the Chinese coming in? Who did they get? Yeah. You know, America. Yeah. Right? yeah. So our our traditional espionage cases, you know, sort of illustrate like, that loyalty is not a function of ethnicity, for right. sure. Um, you know, we've had three cases in the last year against ex U.S. intelligence officers uh, who, um, you know, turned uh, on their country, uh, and uh, and that those are, to me, always very sad cases, um, and. Uh, um, uh, you know, uh, and these, for, these folks were co-opted by the Chinese intelligence services to come over. And, you know, and the last point here is obviously, like, you know, we have to do all our work consistent with our values. <laughs> and uh, so it's, you know, interesting that the, the dean talk about that. I mean, but we, um, this is something that we, uh, you know, spend a lot of time thinking about. And when we're talking to the private sector about what policies you should design, they're very, um, uh, action, you know, activity focused, sort of suspicious activity focused. Who's downloading data? Who's accessing data they shouldn't have? Who has unexplained wealth? Who has financial pressures, et cetera? All these very hard facts that are really uh, where we where we need to be focusing our efforts uh, in that area. In the name alone, I mean, the China Initiative. Yeah. You know, I mean, you're sending a message right there on that. And how does that impact you know our dealings with? China. It's not like, you know, hey, it's the China, you know, the Irish initiative. Now we know Ireland, we're going after you, yeah. we're blocking you off. Here, uh, we, we say it's China. Yep. We're going to go focus on what you're doing. And do you think any of that, I'm just curious, my own thought, um, is that impacting the whole trade war that's going on kind of now or not? Um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, w everything that I do, I'm careful. I'm not involved in Yeah, China. I don't mean to right. put you on the spot at that. And what did you it's see? Like very important a... for folks to understand that nothing that we do is driven by okay. trade. Um, and, uh, it, it, you know, it has certainly, you know, some of our cases, um, you know, uh, 
I mean, we, we get the vociferous denials from the mm -hmm. Chinese government whenever we file one of these indictments. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so you know, I know they're not happy with them, um, but you know how it's changing that whole dynamic. I don't no, know. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. impact what your work. Is. Yeah, it, oh, it doesn't impact what I'm working on. It. Yeah, I mean, I just, you know, we're looking at violations of U.S. law and where we find them. Mm -hmm. You know, we're happy to bring yeah. charges. And when you hit, you're going out to the private sector. You yeah, know, uh, are you finding pushback, or are they? I, I, I would think, but I don't know. That's why I'm asking. Uh, are they ready to work with you and collaborate? Uh, I think, well, um, a little bit of of both. You know, the private sector is receptive to the art. The, the, the value that any company has is um, its intellectual property, right? Sometimes, and that, that's embodied in different things depending on the kind of company it is. But that's what they're monetizing. So when I go to the private sector and I say, well, you know, you really have to guard that incredibly valuable, sensitive intellectual property, that resonates immediately with them. And then if you talk about the ways in which the Chinese are using their intelligence services to either co-opt employees or to do cyber intrusions. You know, that's something that I think, you know, companies take to. I think, you know, where uh, um, th that, so I, I've been happy with that. Now, companies are still reluctant sometimes to become, you know, to be on the forefront. You know, if you, you, know, if you end up with an indictment and you're named in the indictment and then people know some of your intellectual property was stolen, that's a concern of theirs, right? And uh, so, you know, it's not, you know, we still, I think, have a ways to go in terms of encouraging the private sector to work with us. But I think we have come a long ways also from, from where we were at the beginning. And I mean, think about data breaches. You know, when we had the first data breach, um, the first significant one, you know, people thought, okay, well, I'm not gonna shop at that store anymore. And that's what companies were worried about. Right. Well, if I said that now, I will, yeah, I'd be like not eating, not wearing anything, not, you know, like where am I going to go? All sorts of folks have been breached, right. right? So I think some of the stigma of being breached has, has come away. Right. And we try to work very hard with the private sector to make sure that we're not kind of re-victimizing the victim, right, by the, either the investigative process or um, our messaging uh, on these cases. And, you know, we try to keep them confidential for as long as we possibly can if that's what they want. Mm -hmm. And next up, uh, we have you know a few minutes left. But uh, how are the results? How's the China Initiative going? You know, if you so, give us an example, of a couple of cases. That yeah, you I mean, so there's a the you know the the Micron case. I think although obviously the the prosecutions aren't done, but I think it was already a success in terms of um, you know mitigating the harm uh, to Micron. I think you know one other thing we've been focused on is getting our international partners to work with us. Okay. So if you look at our indictment in uh, December of, of 2018 mm -hmm. against this group called APT10, uh, which was basically uh, a group of Chinese actors uh, breaking into managed service providers, and then once you're into the managed service providers, going out to the companies that the managed service right. providers are providing services for, and. Um, uh, you know, that indictment had 12 other com countries, was supported by 12 other countries, not indicted because everyone has their own legal system, but doing the attribution uh, as well. And that, so that's a success, I think, of the work we're trying to do. We don't want to be alone. I mean, what we're saying is we're vindicating international cyber norms, right. so we don't want to be alone in vindicating international cyber norms. Um, we want the partnerships with other countries who see the world in the same way that we do. Um, so there's been successes on that front. I think, you know, in addition, you know, we've had a number of other cases, you know, most of which are still pending, uh, but we had one case last October that involved the, the first ever extradition of a Chinese intelligence officer from Belgium, mm -hmm. right? He was involved, allegedly, in the theft of intellectual property from an American jet engine maker and um, uh, thought, that he was in Belgium to meet with this person who he had thought he had co-opted and um, instead was arrested by the Belgians and ultimately extradited here. So um, that was very good. Obviously that was noticed by, by the Chinese. Um, and you know, again, an example of great international cooperation from the Belgians. Uh, but, but the cases keep coming, you know, and um, we, you know, we're taking a hard look now sort of in the ac academic part of this at um, sort of the, 
the use of talent programs and other uh, recruitment mm -hmm. efforts by the Chinese to bring, some of which are totally lawful and fine, right? They're the lawful above board kind of poaching. Wow, you're really talented at what you do. Why don't you come work here and we'll pay you a good salary. That's fine. But, um, you know, the problem in the cases that we've indicted involve people who have not disclosed their, so they continue to work at the American institution uh, doing the research, but then they're alleged not to have disclosed their affiliation also with a Chinese institution of the town programs. So you're getting paid and your actual, you know, your main employer doesn't know that you have this other competing loyalty, mm -hmm. right? So that's been a focus for us and we've had a couple of cases recently on that front. You know, those are not, you know, the, our hook, our sort of federal legal hook is, you know, federal grant money, federal research money that's right. going to programs that, that they're researching in. It is now a legal requirement to, if you're getting federal money to state that you're receiving, you know, where your other sources of income are. One of the things that we are pitching to academia is, you know, even in areas that are not funded by federal money, it's in your interest to be sure that you understand, you know, if your professors have uh, competing and, or divided loyalties. That doesn't mean they can't do it. That just means that if you, you should know that they're doing it and then you can judge on a case-by-case -case basis whether it's in the interest of you, the university, to have them have that kind of, of uh, financing from another source. Um, so, uh, yeah, those are, I think, some of the, the examples of what we've yeah, been Some of the things you talked about with the academia, with the worst in protecting our data, right? We have the no access management controls, uh, open systems, and we don't you know, require like, hey, you can have access, why do you need access to the research I'm doing? And I think mm -hmm. you know, going out and educating the researchers and you know, the academy, you know, like you're spending a lot of time and what you're creating could be worth billions of dollars and all it's gonna take is someone to hack into your Google account to take it. <laughs> Maybe we should have better practices. Yeah, and it's a different, but academia is a different culture, right? So when I say I go to the private sector and right away they say, oh yeah, I jealously guard this little bit of intellectual property. In academia, the idea at a high level is sharing ideas right. so that we all benefit from one another's work, right? And we're constantly building on one another's work. So within that framework and without changing the framework, the challenge in academia is protecting that which needs to be protected. And so that's why I talk about you know ensuring transparency, right. right, about the work that people are doing at at a university or a research institution, and I mean, which is not to say no, you shouldn't be collaborating with some Chinese right. uh, university, or uh, but you again just to say you should know when this is going on, uh, and so that you, so that you're aware of and comfortable with exactly what's going on, mm -hmm. because I will tell you that there are things going on at university campuses now that the universities would not want going on. So I'll give it, yep. Take an example uh, of, uh, you know, a, a professor who comes here to work on something. Now, it may be that that's perfectly appropriate work that they're doing together, no export control violations, or classified information. But you might not be so happy to learn that in at least one instance, if we were in a classified setting and you had clearances, I could show you a photo of a lab that looks exactly like the photo of the lab that this guy was working in. Is that what you thought you were getting? when that professor came over to work here? Right, probably not, right? right? Um, or, you know, we have cases of people who say they're here to study X, and X is totally fine, and it turns out they're in Y lab, and it's not fine to be in Y lab, right? So that, that's the areas that when I go, you know, in a university setting, I'm focused on, again, it's not, it's not don't study with people. I mean, I come from a world of academics. Like, I'm the one who ran away and joined the law firm. Um, I, like I, when I'm here, I feel like I'm at home, right? And so this is how I grew up. I mean, and this, my parents' friends were other academics, so this is just the environment I grew up in. So I, I understand that, and, but what I'm saying is, you know, you have to be aware of what's happening on your campuses, and, and you should make sure that you know, um, you know, what's going on. So if somebody is here to study something, that is what they're studying, and you're fine with that. But we're not here to tell you, what you should control in terms of intellectual property and what you shouldn't. We tell you that through rights for control law. We tell you that through classifications. Beyond that, it's really up to you to figure that out as a university. I think what's, what needs to be in there are areas. You know, you do have people who are 
privately funding research at universities. They do want to guard their intellectual property. So it's not like everything in the university is an intellectual feast. Excellent. So we have a few minutes left. And um, I'll open it up to some questions. And remember what I told you when I got down here? Uh, I don't want you to get the, you know, do you like Duncan's a Starbucks question? Oh, I, I answer anything. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'll do whatever. I right. only answer it for you, Duncan's. Uh, all right. Uh, Henry in the I back. know my audience. <laughs> <laughs> So um, we obviously have very different systems, economic systems, right? And so we count much more on the private sector to address that disparity than we do on a sort of a controlled economic model where the government figures out how much money needs to be invested in these different technologies, right? So fundamentally, yes, US government investment is going to be a lot lower than Chinese government or Russian government investment in these technologies. Um, but that's because our whole economic model is very different from their own. So, you know, on the area of where folks are in artificial intelligence, that's a little beyond my, uh, you know, scope of work. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it, that's an area I think where the Chinese in particular have done a lot of great work. And look, that kind of investment is totally legitimate and I have no beef with it. In fact, you know, Chinese doing their own research and development and investments they will ultimately make us all better off, right? Because those are, that they will create value, they'll, they'll be innovative, et cetera. Um, what I'm sort of focused on, which doesn't create any value, is when you take value from one person and you give it to another person, you steal value. That doesn't make the world as a whole better off. So that doesn't really answer your question. I don't, I don't know enough about you know, where artificial intelligence research is to answer your question. But I could tell you that all three of those countries are really <laughs> focused on it. That was a good lawyer answer. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Brian. Let me let me give you a microphone so everyone can. Yeah, but for, for the reporting, we're, we're taping it, so I guess. Oh, okay. Uh, what concerns you most, either regards to the China Initiative or maybe just Russia in general, uh, on a separate note? But the willingness to blur the lines between organized crime and state intelligence agencies, and how does that kind of direct your efforts and in, in indictments in pursuing that? So uh, the Chinese, I'm sorry, the Russians blur that line much more than the Chinese. I mean, the Chinese will be doing things like stealing intellectual property that we believe the government shouldn't be doing. But um, the Russians, and some of our cyber cases kind of uh, show this, you know, the Russians are actually using criminal cyber organizations to do their work for them. So in uh, the Yahoo case that we indicted, I mean, the deal the Russians struck with, actually already indicted by us cyber criminals, was, you know, we will protect you. Obviously, we're not going to extradite you to the US. We're going to protect you. You can go ahead and do your cyber criminal activity. You could steal people's credit card information, whatever, you know, normal sort of criminal activity. In exchange, with, well, with one important provi proviso, which is, you will not direct your criminal activity against other Russians, right? So it's Americans and French, everybody else is fair game. But you will, um, but in exchange, you're also going to do cyber intrusions, right, for us that bring value to the Russian intelligence services. So um, that is uh, certainly something that we see uh, on the, you know, uh, on the Russian side, I think, a lot more than um, on, the, on the Chinese side. Um, you know, both types of conduct worries me. I think, and a lot of what obviously Russia did in the 2016 election is something that we've been spending a lot of time focused on as well. Um, but um, I think ultimately the pervasive, systemic, and well-resourced nature of what the Chinese are doing will in the long term 
you know, be a, a very big deal for us. All right, next. Oh, Julia, and then. Thank you. Um, Assistant Attorney General Demers, in terms of international law, um, I know you mentioned Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran. Um, I think what's really interesting, at least from my lens, is what's the next cohort of um, bad actors that you're considering um, in terms of nation state, uh, you know, uh, cyber criminals? Because I think if we're only chasing the ones that are already existing, yeah. we're missing the second and third horizon. So um, one of the reasons why we chase those that are existing is to try to lay down these norms and these rules so that you don't have other countries saying, ah, looks like it's working pretty well for that guy. I'm going to try it myself, right? Um, so you know, we hope that one of the effects of what, of what we're doing is, is discouraging and deterring other people from doing the same thing. There are other countries that are um, increasing their, um, you know, their cyber capabilities. Um, we, you know, so far cases have tended, you know, the other 20% of these cases or the other cyber cases have been more one-offs. But, you know, um, we'll see who comes next. Uh, I think uh, it is something that, that we're looking at. and. There's a lot of, uh, you know, sharing of information too. On you know, just like the various countries share information with one another. On the positive side, folks who are doing uh, activity that we don't agree with are also sharing information with one each other and sharing expertise with one another. So that is uh, an area that we're focused on. I'm not going to comp complicate the State Department's job tonight <laughs> by naming anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Who's over here? Yeah. Evening, sir. Matt Smith from uh, Professor Powers' class. I know you had a break from the NSD. My yep. curiosity is, in that time, how exponential was the growth in cases that you're dealing with and your staff's dealing with that have a cyber component? And how, uh, I guess, how prominent is it now in, in the plethora of people you deal with in their day-to-day -day duties? You mentioned the policy department. I, is it in every? Is every person in your staff really have a cyber component today? Um, so the answer to to your first question is yes. It's been tremendously significant in terms of the amount of growth and the number of cyber cases. The answer to your second question is no. We still have a lot, especially if you think about the counterterrorism side. It, it depends what you mean by cyber case, right? So um, we have a lot of cases on the counterterrorism side that are people who are you know, radicalizing themselves on the internet or in small groups on the internet. I don't consider those really cyber cases. Um, although um, ISIS and others, you know, are clearly have used the internet as a propaganda dissemination tool. And, you know, you can go on and watch uh, videos from leaders of these terrorist groups who, who were killed years ago and are probably still converting people to their radical ideology by the fact that they live on on, on these in videos and uh, you know in text on the internet. So, you know, I, I generally don't think of that as a cyber case, but you could, right? If you think about it that way, you know, the problem with that is it just becomes all encompassing and then I'd say, well, how many aspects of your life are cyber related? And you'd have to say like almost 100%, right? Uh, so, um, but uh, but in, on the side, the sort of the, the the more focused cyber side, you know, the division was reorganized during the prior administration to have a unit that really focuses on nation state uh, cyber act and cyber activity generally, um, and that was a significant uh, uh, reorganization and recognition of how much more activity there was going on in cyber um, today, as you know, it was sort of developing over time, but certainly today from the last time I was there. It is, you know, the biggest change in the division uh, from, you know, this time to the last time I was there. All right, All right sir.
mm -hmm. and how it focuses on uh, the private sector and intellectual property. My question is because people have so much of their lives online, uh, medical right. records, financial records, deeply personal issues. Right. Yeah. Have you seen any nation states taking actors against private individuals? And do you see that potentially being a problem in the future as more and more of our society becomes online, more and more of our traditions are available? So that. Uh, I feel like I planted that question. Um, could, and I, the, I'm uh, sorry, the, uh, I think to save energy, Matt turned this off. Could Kevin, could you briefly restate the question just so we get it? Because I, I don't think it went across on the recording. Yeah, in, in brief it was, uh, you see more of a focus on private individuals uh, in stealing their private uh, information, whether it's healthcare, financial, and other things they're working on, correct? So, um, the answer is, uh, you know, sort of yes and no. Yes, so think about what the Russians did with the hack and then the dump of the DNC emails, right? That was focused on one, mm -hmm. you know, or, or a handful of people's emails. Uh, very vulnerable, you know, if you, whatever email service you use, you know, not the hardest thing to hack into if you're a nation state hacker. Um, very um, uh, difficult to combat because uh, and this is an interesting sort of media issue, I think, uh, but um, what gets hacked and what gets dumped are true documents that have been obtained, obviously, illegally. But, you know, almost everybody has embarrassing stuff in their email. And so this was a technique that was used, remember, in the Sony Pictures hack against Sony, you know, in, in the fit of peak about that movie, uh, right, that Sony had, had done on North Korea. Very embarrassing, very difficult for the company to deal with. A tough issue, I think, uh, for, for the media and others who would comment on those things because you're, it's the truth. It is news. But boy, you hate the way people got it and you hate to encourage people to do that. But that's going to be, as, as troubling as it is, if I want to get your personal data, that's going to be the exception because. Generally, what we do see happening, both in terms of cyber intrusions and um, uh, acquisitions through the CFIUS process, is an interest in what we call pattern of life data, which is basically all the stuff you're talking about put together. The purpose of which is to create a massive database of information on a high number of people. So I'm not going to like target you, target you, target you. You're right. I'm going to try to go after a health insurance company, a financial services company. Right? I'm going to go after some apps that collect a lot of information on your personal life. Um, and then I'm going to put that all together. And I'm probably never going to use 98% of it because I'm not going to care to use it. But when somebody gets to a position where I want to co-op someone and I want to see what they're vulnerable to, do they have financial pressures? How's their health? What's going on with their kids? Are they married? <coughs> right? Are they having affairs? I can learn all of these things if I'm an intelligence officer through your pattern of life data, and I can figure out what's the best way to approach you. Mm -hmm. What are you going to be uh, susceptible to, right? And uh, or if I just want to embarrass you, if you're you know if you take a different approach, or I want to blackmail you, right? So, but the way that that's done is generally acquisitions of large data sets. The OPM hack is a perfect example of this office personnel management. Um, and then combining it, and ultimately through the use of AI, you know, being able to do the analytics on the data a lot more efficiently than you could do today. Perfect. All right, we'll take one more. All right, Peter. Hi, Peter Salvetti. I'm also in uh, Professor Powers' class. I'm the Chief Technical Officer here at Boston College. Where do you stand on the weakening of encryption debate? So. Um, <laughs> You know, the Attorney General was at Fordham uh, about a month ago and he gave a speech on um, the, the law enforcement uh, problems with ubiquitous, I think as you put it, warrant-proof encryption. Um, I can tell you from a law enforcement perspective, this is an issue. I mean, I, I have any number of investigations where you get to a point where you know two people are communicating, but they're using uh, encrypted apps uh, to communicate. and I. You know, we can't see what the content of that communication is. Uh, so that's a problem from an investigative point of view. It's also a problem in ruling people out, 
if that's a perfectly innocent conversation, then I should stop paying attention to those two people, but I can't because I don't really know what they're saying, so I have to stay on and try to figure out what they're doing differently. So um, this is a, you know, has become, especially for state and local law enforcement, but also for uh, the FBI and others, a significant law enforcement uh, issue. And one of the areas where it's really cropping up, and there's going to be an encryption summit at the Justice Department October 4th, um, but one of the areas where this is really cropping up is um, in childhood sexual exploitation on the internet, right? And I was over in, um, in the UK, they had the Five Eyes meeting, so the five, you know, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the US, um, the Attorney General and the Home Ministers together, and we had a presentation from uh, a, um, a group that works with child exploitation victims. And they rely on tips from social media companies you know, uh, to the government and to them as they try to help these, these kids, try to liberate these kids from what's happening to them. And I have to say, like, I, it was a powerful presentation that, that demonstrates the challenges. If, if these social media companies all go to end, end encryption, it's going to be really hard for them to tip us or to tip uh, advocacy groups are not, they're really more than advocacy group, they're actually trying to get kids out of the cycle of it um, uh, to any of this behavior. So the point of all this is there is a real cost to encryption. So as we have this debate about what the right answer, we, we cannot pretend that there's no cost to encrypted apps. Now we also understand that since we do so much of our lives on the internet, encryption is an important part of, um, uh, of protecting ourselves against you know, the theft of, of data and information about us. Um, but you know, I think at the end of the day, we have never had a warrant-proof means of communicating in this country. Uh, and, and that's because we have balanced through the Fourth Amendment through our courts the sort of the privacy rights of individuals with um, the need for government charged by its people to, um, to protect those people and, and to protect the country. All right, um, perfect. Thank you, sir, Great. for stopping Thank you, by. thanks for having me. Uh, a lot of fun. <laughs> we have a gift for you. And, uh, you know, you know I, I was advised, you know, the $20 yes. dollar gift limit. Yeah, and get him. <laughs> yeah. Glad they told you that. Boston College, Jesuit institution, we were more than happy to accommodate that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's an well, I thank yeah. you, but you know. <laughs> it's a bag with <laughs> I went, so it's just this bag. <laughs> and uh, my wife also went to Holy Cross, so I'm not sure I can go home. It's just like, hey, look what I got. I got this PC well, bag. Show me what you have. Then I got the mugs on there. That's great. Yeah, thank you very course. much. Awesome. Great. Thank you, sir. Thanks. I appreciate it. <laughs>